thank thee from the depths of our heart for the Lord Jesus, who is our life. And in him we find no fault, but we find in ourselves fault when we look into his life and examine ours by his. We pray that you forgive us. We ask tonight that you will meet with us. You promised that wherever two or more would meet together, that you would be in the midst, and if we would ask anything, that it would be granted. Father, our, our motive and our objective tonight and our longing in our heart is to see Christ glorified. So we pray that our efforts tonight will be, as they continue, to bring people to a living faith and a living God that a God that is not dead but is alive forevermore. We pray, Father, that you will stir our souls tonight with thy presence. Through Jesus Christ, we ask it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> just a little late and just a little tired. I've been going since Christmas with had any let up, so I'm pretty tired. I was glad tonight to see Brother Joseph Jose, who I've been looking to see him for some time, returning from the fields uh, across the sea. And uh, sorry to say tonight that our precious brother and friend here, Brother Tommy Hicks, is leaving us tonight for our tomorrow morning for Canada to have a meeting. I tried to get him to come out and preach for me tonight because I was so tired or either have the prayer line and he, he backed up on me. So, And he said, the next time, the next time. And, and he keeps telling me that. And I, I know that Brother Tommy Hicks is, I have the days that I've had with him and the times and the fellowship, I certainly have a great confidence in Tommy Hicks of being a servant of the living God. A great masterpiece that I don't believe that there would be anybody could say anything against the leading of the Holy Spirit to Brother Hicks. Or he was just uh, one day when you he, he heard of his message going to Argentina and he didn't even have the money to go, but the Lord sent him and oh, you know about the meeting. And a person that can yield to God like that, you know, God can only use what part of you, you yield to him. See, as I said, I believe one day somewhere, I talk so much in different places and mornings and afternoon meetings and what more. Um, but I said this, that God can use what you yield, like Samson. Samson would not yield his heart to God. He gave that to Deliah. But he gave his strength to God, and God could only use his strength. That's all. But if a fellow could only yield his complete being to God, uh, that's it. If you can yield your... Your body, God will use your body. If you can use your mind, your heart, whatever it is, God will use what you give to him to use with. He's seeking to find somebody that he can find yielded like that. God be with you, Brother Tommy. Give you a great, great success. We'll pray for you in your service with him. And I'll be in Canada too in a few days, but up in the other end. <laughs> give you a great success and safe journey. We, thank you. And same to you, Brother Tom. We uh, had a great time this morning in fellowship around the table of God this morning at, uh, where we asked the blessing and had a ministerial breakfast, the first time I've been privileged to meet the ministerial group of this, this city. I certainly found some great men, great servants of Christ with great hearts reaching out for God. And I trust that we'll... Sometime can get back where you have a full place all together and a big fellowship meeting and, and have a great meeting uh, all together here in Chicago. Now, there was uh, last evening, I think we was praying for the sick, and <clears throat> Sunday afternoon I preached on the subject of Abraham and his seed after him. Last night, I preached on the subject of the greatest news flash that ever struck the world in history. And tonight, if you will turn in the scriptures, if you care to, to Matthew, the 11th chapter and the 6th verse, I'll read these words. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. 
I'm going to call this subject the forgotten beatitude. We are all acquainted with the Beatitudes. Over in the, the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus uh, taught the Beatitudes. When he taken the people and went up on the mount just before the beginning or just as his ministry started, he became their leader. And he went up and taught the Beatitudes and began uh, you've heard them say them of old time, but I say them to you, and so forth. Now, Jesus was a perfect type of, or uh, Moses was a type of Jesus. Jesus is an antitype of Moses. Moses was a, a prophet. He was a lawgiver. He was a, kind of a, like a king over the people in the wilderness, Israel, and he was born uh, a prophet, he was hid from Pharaoh, just as Jesus was hid from the Roman Empire, and he, his ministry and life just typed right along. And Moses, when he got the children of Israel in the wilderness, he went up into the mount and got the commandments, came down and began to teach the commandments. And Jesus, when he came into his power, he went up on the mount and sat down and began to teach the people, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when you're reviled and persecuted and made fun of and so forth. For they persecute the prophets which was before you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, because great is your reward in heaven. He was typing uh, Moses at, at Zachary. Moses' was type was a type of him. And we're all acquainted with those types of what Moses was and what Jesus was teaching the Beatitudes. But this Beatitude is on over in the 11th chapter and the 6th verse. And if you don't watch, you'll read right over the top of it. And uh, you won't get it. It's wedged in between other words. But it is a beatitude. And he said, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Oh, yeah. See? Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are, blessed are. And way over here, he slips this beatitude in again. See? Blessed, and, uh, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Oh, it was a great time in those days. Now, we find that what caused this to start was just after the ministry of this great, rugged New Testament of Elijah, John the Baptist. And uh, that's who the message was sent to. And uh, John had been placed in prison because of his ministry. And oh, what a rugged fellow John was. And he was really, truly the messenger, Jesus said, that shall go before me. And he was an outdoor man. And how, when they caught him, he was perfectly like Elijah, who his spirit was anointed. He was the anointed Elijah of the New Testament. How that Elijah was a, a kind of a man that didn't like the way Jezebel, immoral women lived, and John the same thing. And Elijah lived in the wilderness, John the same thing. Uh, John was a, kind of a stood by alone, just like Elijah did, and that great rugged man from the wilderness, and then had him down in an old musty, wet, damp jail. That must have been a horrible experience for John, a man that had been free yeah. out in the wilderness, having his meat with the locusts and honey and the wilderness journey out there where he could kill what he eat or take what he wanted out of the wilderness, and now he's down in a little old musty, dirty jail, perhaps dark in a dungeon somewhere because 
that uh, wife Jezebel of uh, Arodia had had him thrown in there because it, he had told him that it wasn't right for him to take uh, Herod to take his brother Philip's wife and live with her. It wasn't lawful for him to do it. And John was one of those men that did not hold back any punches. He just let her fly. It made no difference to him. If it was a head off, it was a head off. That's all. Just like Elijah. He was uh, right out forward with what he had to say. What was right was right. If it was wrong, it was wrong. God, we need more like that today. Um, a man who will stand on real, genuine convictions of the Word of God, speak it. And don't hold your peace. Speak it out. And then we find there that John, down in this little old musty, dirty jail with some dirty bread they'd probably throw into him once in a while, he'd probably gotten thin and no way to read his Bible, and he would got kind of, his, as one writer wrote about him one time, said his eagle eye got thinned over. Uh, you know, the prophets are likened unto eagles. And God calls his prophets eagles. is because an eagle is the uh, most powerful of all the birds. And uh, the eagle can go higher, soar higher than any other bird. And he's got a better eye than any other bird. They talk about a hawk having an eye, or a hawk being able to fly up in the air, while if a hawk would try to follow an eagle, he'd disintegrate in the air. He sure would. And now what good is it to go do the eagle get up there if he hasn't got enough eye to see work back down to the earth again? It's just like if, what are we doing jumping high if we don't know what we're jumping about? See? And uh, what are we testifying high or uh, making a lot of noise if we haven't got nothing to make a noise about? <laughs> see? And it's different now. The noise is fine if you got something to make a noise about. But wait till that comes first, and it'll be a noise all your life then. But we find that this eagle eye had got filmed over because they had taken him out of his habitation from the wilderness and had put him down into an old, dirty, musty jail. And this great man who could be an eagle to soar up in the air, now higher you get, further away you can see. They get up now in these balloons and things so they can, so high in the air that they can take a picture of the entire earth in its curvature. And I suppose in this new gadget that Russia's got, and cross around the world in about an hour and 45 minutes, why, they can take the entire movie of it turning. But the uh, higher you get, more you can see. Therefore, the prophets in the Bible were those eagles who could soar way up and above the congregation and find out what thus saith the Lord was and come back down and bring the news. See? Therefore, the word of the Lord came to the prophets. And John, being caged off, why, it filmed that eagle eye over. I felt so sorry one time for a big eagle, and I just can't stand to go to a zoo to see them poor things caged up, lions, and how it's just in prison for life. And um, little Sarah and I, one time at the Cincinnati Zoo over here, was walking around, and Mother was uh, getting our dinner ready. We was up with the children up there. They like to take the little boat rides and see the monkeys and what more. So we were walking around while Mother was fixing the dinner. And I heard a noise, and I went down to the bottom of the hill to see what it was, and it just caught a big eagle, and it put him in a cage. And I looked at that poor fellow there, and he was bleeding all over his head, and the feathers was all beat off his head and off the ends of his wings, and I watched the big fellow walk across there, then here he'd come, trying to take off like the eagle does, and hit his head against those bars and knock him backwards and fall on the floor and lay there and roll those big eyes around and look up like that and get back again. And here he come and hit against some bars again and 
blood and feathers knocked out of him and he'd lay on his back and roll those big eyes and look up. Why? He was a heavenly bird. He was looking up to where he ought to be. But some cunning device it is a man had put him in a cage. And I thought that was the most horrible, pitiful sight I'd have bought that eagle if I'd, if I'd had to take up my first offering to, to bought that eagle, to turn him loose. I thought, that poor fella. I thought, my, if that ain't awful, that born to be a heaven-soaring bird, and here he is by the device that is a man all caged up, and he's just beating his brains out, but he's caged. I thought that's the most horrible sight I ever seen. Then I turned around to walk away and I thought, yes, that's a horrible sight, but I've seen something more horrible than that. To see men and women who are born to be sons and daughters of God caged in some kind of a cage. When they look up and know there's a God of heaven, know that he's a great healer and a great master and a great savior. And then put in some kind of an ecclesiastical cage where they just beat their brains out with all kinds of societies and everything else and never be able to get out of the cage. That's a pitiful condition. Tell them all about a great God that was and build them up under expectations and knock the whole thing out from under them. He died and put in the tomb and that's all of it. He's not like he used to be. That's a pitiful sight. To see people, men and women, who are born to be children of God and be caged in to such things as that. John, his eagle eye, truly had filmed over. And John was become weary. He and uh, Elijah was a great deal alike because the same spirit was up on the uh, different man. See, God never takes his spirit, he just takes his man. God took Elijah, and took Elijah's spirit and put on Elisha, then he took it off of Elisha and put it on John and promised to put it on again just at the end time. Another one uh, coming at the end time. Another Elisha, which we all as Bible readers know it, that's promised to us. Now, we find out then that the devil takes his man but never his spirit. And he just keeps coming right on down, just the same way. And we find out that those two are together, and we find that, that Elijah and John was a great deal alike. They were real nervous men. Both of them almost had a nervous breakdown, both of them. And men who live close to God are mostly considered neurotics or something wrong with them. That's right, they're always considered that. Paul, this morning when I was speaking to the ministerial group, Agrippa said to him, or Festus said, too much learning makes you mad or crazy. He said, I'm not mad. I'm not crazy. I'm sober. See, And I, I'm all right. And um, to, they claim like William Capper, I believe it was, when I stood at his grave there at London, and he wrote that famous song, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. That man was so inspired till he, after he tried to take a rope and hang himself, the rope broke. He tried to go to the river to commit suicide, and the cab couldn't even find the river. It was so foggy. And just to show that how that, that inspiration catches a man, catches him away, then when he comes out of that like Stephen Foster gave this nation its greatest folk song, uh, Old Black Joe, down the Swanee River, Old Kentucky home. Every time that he'd get inspiration and write a song, then he would get on a drunk. Finally, he got out from under the inspiration and called a servant and took a razor and committed suicide. And now think about Jonah the prophet, God inspiring him. That great eagle of the air of that day. God inspired him so till he went down there and laid in the belly of a whale for three days and nights. Walked out upon the bank and gave a message that made even them people put sackcloth on their animals. And when the Spirit left him, he went up on top of the hill and sat down and asked God to let him die. 
right. We find this great Elijah, who John was a type of, the great eagle of that day, mighty, rugged man, great woodsman, lived in the woods in a cave. And he came out, stomped out into amongst the people, and God would take him up into places that uh, Israel know nothing about, and declare the message and says, Thus saith the Lord, and stomp back into the wilderness again. Yeah. Find that great eagle. When he stomped out there and told that king, there will not even be dew come from the heavens, but according to my word. Walked right back out there when he walked down that Samaritan road that day, that stick in his hand, that piece of sheepskin wrapped around, that bald head of shining, whiskers hanging down them steps as the study as they could be, coming down that Samaritan road. But he knowed who he had been in the presence of. He wasn't afraid of what Ahab was going to say because he had been in the presence of somebody greater than Ahab. He had been in the presence and he had, Thus saith the Lord. Those old eyes set back, all those wrinkles was looking right towards the sky. He's walking steady because he know he had, thus saith the Lord. Oh, he was the eagle. Went up on top of the mountain and drunk at the brook there until it went dry and went back down there and called a, a meeting when God gave him a vision, went up on top of the mountain and said, let's prove who's God. Let's see who's God. If he ever was God, he's still God. That's right. Oh, I like them eagles. <laughs> yes, sir. Went up on there and said, "If he, let's prove God. And he said, call the way that God told him the vision. He said, you take a bullock, and, and I'll take a bullock, and you call on Balaam, and I'll call on God. And every which one answers before I let him be God. And while he was so certain of himself, so certain of his vision, while they were calling on Balaam all morning and cutting themselves and screaming and jumping, he walked around and said, Say, maybe you better holler a little more. Maybe he's pursuing, or maybe he's taking a nap. Mm -hmm. Oh, he knew where he was standing. It was. But after he had proved God, his eagle eye become filmed. And when Jezebel threatened that she would kill him, he run out into the wilderness. God found his servant laying under a juniper tree. Running after he had proved God to be God. Nervous. Upset. When you go up in those spheres that does something to the human heart, when you come down, you, you can't explain it. It takes you somewhere. There's no need of trying to talk about it. Visions and so forth that tear you to pieces. You can't tell the other people. They don't understand it. They've never been there, so how would you know about it? So it tears them to pieces. God's so kind to his servant, oh, to feed him and encourage him and out under the juniper tree. But after he had had such confidence in Jehovah, so sure... And he could walk up before the king and said, Not even do a fall, but according to my word. Stomped right out of the king's palace. Anointed. Then he had a vision of what to do. Then he went right out there on that mountain and took and called down fire out of the heavens. Yes. Proving he was God. Yes. Then called rain down out of the heavens on the same day. And then killed 400 men, priests, pagan priests, cut their heads off, and then run when the vision left him, nervous, sitting out there, said, I'm no better than the rest of my fathers. I'm no more than any other prophets. Now, Lord, take my life. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one preaching the right gospel, so just take my life. Let me go. They get all frustrated like that. God said, no, I, I got, I got 700,000 more and had never bowed their knee to Balaam yet, see. But I, that's all right, Elijah, you're doing a great work, but I, I still got another bunch, see, that you don't know yet. But take my life. I'm no more than my father's was. Prophets before me. Let me die. Here, John, a whole lot like him. 
laying down here in prison, mustering out, after he had stood on the banks of the Jordan, come out of the wilderness, received the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb three months before he was born. Certainly did. How? When he first heard the name of Jesus Christ. When Mary come up there and she had uh, well, not yet, she had never felt nothing. The angel had just overshadowed her. The Holy Spirit had told her she took off to Judea. And she was uh, told Elizabeth that she was uh, going to be mother. And said, uh, God uh, has overshadowed me and I'm going to have a child. And said, I call his name Jesus. And little John was six months already. Elizabeth was in her motherhood, pregnancy, and she had not yet even felt life. And so while she was standing looking at Mary's face, and Mary telling her what the Holy Ghost said was going to happen, and had told about the experience that she had had, an old woman had conceived, and then how her husband is stricken dumb. And while standing there, she said, I, I should go to have a son and call his name Jesus. And as soon as that precious, glorious name of Jesus was spoke first in the human lip, a little dead baby laying in his womb jumped and come to life and received the Holy Ghost in the mother's womb. Said, Whence comes the mother of my Lord? For as soon as thy salutation come to my ears, my baby leaped in the womb for joy. And the Bible said he was born from his mother's wounds full of the Holy Ghost. A man called of God. Come out into the wilderness at nine years old. No education. Took off into the wilderness as a woodsman. At 30 years old he came out of the wilderness preaching such a message of a coming Messiah that he shook the regions. And he wasn't afraid of the doctrine of the Pharisees. He said, said, you snakes in the grass, don't you come around here saying we have Abraham to our father? You generation of vipers. Who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Oh, my. He was rough. He said, I'm telling you of a Messiah that's coming with a fan in his hand. Amen. He'll thoroughly purge his floor. He'll take his wheat to the garner and he'll burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Whew. You know what he was talking about. Now, but when this Messiah finally came, when Messiah finally came and John had the honor of baptizing him, he came just, just exactly right. All the signs was right. He showed the Messiah sign, and John knew that, that he was a Messiah. That's the Messiah. There's no doubt about it. John said, I saw that pillar of fire light coming down upon him in the form of a dove, a voice speaking from that pillar of light, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased to dwell in. He knew that was the Messiah. John said, I didn't know him, but he is in the wilderness said for me to go baptize with water, set up on whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on. He's the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. And I'm sure this is him. So he blasted it out. But when trouble set in, Jesus come and showed the Messiah that he was Messiah. But then something went wrong. John had introduced the Messiah with a fan in his hand, going to burn up the chaff. But he found out the works of Jesus. He was meek and lowly. So it wearied him. He didn't know, he didn't know what to say. He, uh, he thought, now there's something wrong here somewhere. Seemed he had, he had believed the wrong thing. It seemed like it wasn't working right. And there's many times that we think, too, that it isn't working right. But it's working right as long as we know that he's here. What difference does it make? It's working right. Maybe it ain't working according to the way we think it ought to work, but it's working according to the way God wants it to work. You say, well, John thought, well, now, I introduced the Messiah that had his fan in his hand. He's going to purge the floors and... Take his wheat to the garner and 
And I uh, told him the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and he's going to take all the trash and burn it up. And here he is, instead of a great, mighty man like that, here he comes meek and lowly. Something must have went wrong somewhere, he said. There's no doubt, but something's wrong somewhere. He thought it wasn't right. He become dismayed like many of us do. When we see things going on that it isn't what we think is just right, we become dismayed. Don't be weary. It'll be all right. The devil got a hold of him in there. The devil thought, now I've got him in the jail now. I've thrown him in jail, so I'll rough him up right good while I got him in there. God isn't using him right now. I've got him in jail, so I'll just put every kind of a blanket over him I can. I got him all caged up. I got the eagle in the cage. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make him wish he had never preached the gospel. That's the way he does a many, and there's a many a good man in that same shape today. It's exactly right. We think it ain't working right. But it is working right. Everything's all right. You're the other day a little, I see so many people that come and say, well, Brother Bram, I was prayed for that. Uh, I, I really didn't get any different. Well, there's something wrong. No, there's not. There's nothing wrong with the system. There's nothing wrong with God. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. There's nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit. The thing of it is, there's something wrong with you. Everything was running all right. It's a job. That's all. So this lady came down the other day from, from Zion City. She may be here now, about a month ago. That little woman, uh, her little husband, a beautiful little couple, and they came down to my place, and, and they come down with some good friends of mine, Sims is from up there at the Zion. And they may all be sitting here tonight as far as I know. And she had a little baby, I think it was born, with his foot hanging up like this, and, and couldn't get his foot down. And, and she just said, if I can only see Brother Branham put his hands on this baby, that foot will drop down. Well, she brought his shoes to wear home and everything. That's yes, sir. So I was praying up at the tabernacle and, or preaching, and then when I got through, I was trying to make a way to get out to another meeting and or over in Bloomington, Illinois. And then the first thing you know, when I started to leave the platform, I believe we was going in to take foot washing. We're we believe in foot washing. I, I believe that's uh, uh, the Bible teaches that. And we're supposed to do it until he comes. And so we try to keep every word that he said. And we is observing this at our church, which we always have for 30 years now. We were going in for foot washing, and, and my son come up and said, uh, Dad, there's, there's the people come from Zion there. said, they expected to have prayer for the sick tonight. He said, it got a little baby that... That woman believes if you'd ever pray for that baby, that little leg would drop down. It's got a bad leg. I said... Bring it here. And the little, beautiful little mother, she came up and she said, um, My baby, Brother Branham, we have believed, husband and I, when you lay your hands on this baby, that the leg is going to come straight, it's going to be all right. I said, Do you require me to find a vision from the Lord? He said, No, sir, just lay your hands on it. I said, All right, I'll do that. Laid my hands up on it, prayed for it, went on in the room, and the next day I was out the office. When I was sitting out there and, and uh, answering some calls and, and uh, doing some work there at the office, a car drove up and the little lady got out of her and her husband, and here they come, said, Brother Branham, so I said, something went wrong. I said, oh, uh, what do you mean? Well, she said, uh, the, the baby's leg's not down yet. And I said, uh, well, what's that got to do with it? And she said, well, I, I, I believe, Brother Brandon, I believe that if you'd ever lay your hands on my baby, that God would heal it. said, I believed it. And said, something went wrong somewhere. She said, maybe you better have a vision for it. I said, no. No, there's nothing wrong. Not another thing wrong. Only thing's wrong is you. See? I said, you just believe it. She said, one thing I'll ask, Brother Branham. Do you think it's God's will for my baby to be crippled? I said, I do not believe it's God's will. She said, that's all I want you to say. <laughs> Out of there she went, and a few days ago they called up, and now the baby's leg's back normal. Come down. 
they, see, if we just get a flusterated, that's all. Everything's running all right. Everything's just according to time. So we find out here that the devil tries to make the people believe or disbelieve. So the devil's trying to get John to disbelieve that he was the Messiah. So he got two of his disciples together and he sent them out. So now you go out and find wherever he's preaching. And when you do, you go out and ask him, have I been wrong? <laughs> could you imagine that? Could, could, I, could I have been wrong? Is he really the same one? I know the sign was right. I've seen the Messiah sign. I know that was right. But, but this meek and lowly and all this, I, I don't get it. it don't, I can't figure it up. I can't make an ends meet with it. You're not supposed to make ends meet. If I could tell you the whole thing and you know it all and I know it all, it would no more be faith. Anything that I can perfectly explain is not faith anymore. By faith are you saved. By faith are you healed. You just believe it. You can't explain it. You just believe it. So he said, you go and ask John, or ask him if we should look for another. It was my, as my faith, my confidence, and my, my, I saw that Messiah sign over him. And, and have I been wrong? Have, have I been mixed up? Now, uh, if something went wrong? Now, when these disciples came to Jesus with this great prophet's message, uh, Jesus never said to them, um, Now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you back some literature to give to John, how to be happy in jail. <laughs> no, he never said that. <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't say, I'll, uh, I'll give you a book on patience. <laughs> and you tell John how to be a, a, a patient while he's in jail. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. He's in jail. I hate to see him in jail, but I'll tell him how, how to do it, well, just to be happy. No, he never said that. You know what he said? He said, just stay till this afternoon's meeting. Just stay over. Then you can leave after that. Just watch this afternoon's meeting. And after Jesus had the meeting, I'd imagine those disciples of John sitting there watching every movie he made called John had taught him what that Messiah was and told him what it was and these were his disciples and they begin to see what has taken place. So then after the service is over, then when the two disciples went back to meet John, he said, go tell John the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and all that comes to the meeting is poor. All the, the poor people's got the gospel preached to them. And so uh, tell John not to be scared, not to think anything different. I'm right on schedule. Everything's running right. Everything's all right. I'm right on schedule. Go tell him. There's a healing service going on. The poor's got the gospel preached. The power of God's moving among them. I'm right on schedule. Don't pay attention to nothing else. I'm right on schedule. Oh, my. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. Now, don't be offended. I believe there's more people offended in Jesus than any other person that ever lived on earth. They get offended too quick. Jesus, now in this uh, misplaced beatitude slipped over there so we could get it tonight. Why, he said... Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Don't be offended in me. No more that takes place. I'm, everything's working right on schedule, so you just, just go ahead and believe it. That's all. Everything's all right. Just go ahead and believe it. You know, there, Jesus didn't rebuke John for that. He didn't say, well, I'm ashamed of my apostle. I'm ashamed of my prophet. No, he never said that. He didn't say, what's the world going to say about this? When you come preaching, oh, such a great Messiah, such a great Messiah, and then you send out to ask if I'm the Messiah. He never rebuked him. But when John said the worst thing that he could say to Jesus, Jesus said the best thing that John ever had said about him. Yes. Jesus, John said, go see if he is that one. And after they left, Jesus said to them, he said after the disciples of John left, 
So what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see a man and, uh, dressed up and fine? You no, know, he was too far from Hollywood for that. So he said, did you go to see a man in fine raiment? So they're of king's palaces. He said, what did you go to see? A, a, a reed that this any denomination could blow any way it wanted to? Oh, certainly didn't. So what did you go to see a prophet? Said, yes, you went to see a prophet and a greater. He's more than a prophet. Said, this is that Elias. This is that one that is sped by the prophet. I send my messenger before my face. Said, Very I say to you, there's never been a man born of a woman as great as John the Baptist. He never condemned him. He knew that he was anointed with the spirit of Elijah, and that spirit was on him. That's what did it. He knew everything was running all right. Everything was running according to schedule. John, why was he greater than, than all the prophets? Now, if you're spiritual, you'll catch something. Why was he the greatest? All the other prophets that spoke of the Messiah. Amen. But John introduced him. Amen. He was the one that presented him. Amen. So will it be in the end time. Amen. Everything's running according to schedule. Don't be offended. Just believe. Today the churches are offended in him. Amen. The churches are offended. The people are offended. They're all frustrated. They don't know what to think. Mental telepathy, something else. No, no, don't be offended. Our message last Sunday was trying to show you what God did to Abraham and to his seed after him. And we found out at every junction he'd taken Abraham, he took his seed. Through justification, through sanctification, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, through the placing of a son, and then God came in human flesh, turned his back to Sarah's tent, and told what she was thinking in her heart. Don't get scared. He's right on schedule. <laughs> He's here. Don't be offended at him. Blessed are they who is not offended in me. Sure to speak tonight, he'd say the same thing. He's right on schedule. The prophet said there would be a time that would be not day or night, but in the evening time it shall be light. He's right on schedule. He's done come through justification, Luther age, sanctification, Wesley age, Pentecostal age, done placed his gifts into the church. And now appeared to us in our flesh. As Jesus said he would. Don't be offended at him. He's right on time. John, get out of that jail. Get out of that organization that don't believe in it. Pull the feathers back off your eyes. You're a free man if you believe it. He's right on time. It shall be light in the evening time. Amen. The evening lights are shining. What is he? The same Jesus. The same sun that rises in the east is the same sun that sets in the west. The Son of God rose on the eastern people. What did he do to prove to the Samaritans and the Jews that he was Messiah by showing a sign to them? That he was the prophet that Moses spoke of. The Samaritan woman witnessed the same thing, saying... We know that when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he. She ran into the city and said, isn't this the very Messiah? The man told me what was wrong with me, what I'm doing. Isn't that the Messiah? And the people believe him. He did that to the Samaritans and to the Jews, but not to the Gentiles. For the gospel went to the Gentiles, he's already glorified in glory. But it shall be light in the evening time. What did the church do? Went off into Catholicism, organized the church. Then Luther pulled out for justification for the seed. Then Wesley come from Luther, sanctification. Then the Pentecostals, and they organized, and on and on and on in their systems. And on down, now we get to the last days. What is it? 
But in the evening time, before the body was changed of Sarah and Abraham to receive the promised son, he came, sat with them, talked with them, and done a sign before them. And Jesus referred to it. We're not behind. Don't look back to what Luther said, what Wesley said. Look what Jesus said. Look at the sign where we're at. Don't look back what somebody else said. Look what he said. He was the one set. And the same sun that rises in the east sets in the west. There's been a dismal day. It certainly has been. Enough light to see how to join churches and make organizations and so forth. But that real power and manifestations of the presence of God has not been seen for years and years and years. We felt it. We know the cheer. And we've seen gifts work with it. But when we see him come visible among us with power in his church to reach up on the hem of the garment of that master and touch it, bring back down his power here and speak to his people here and reveal, making him God, God with us. Oh, yes, John, God opened the prison doors tonight and let you out. Blessed is he who's not offended in me, not a mind reading or a telepathy but a power of a risen Christ who's soon coming. Let us pray. Dear God, as the evening lights are shining, it puts the eyes of many out, but others are using it to walk in. I pray, God, that the night that you will give the evening lights again into the, this evening people, and may they see the power of your resurrection. For you said yourself that the works that I do shall you also. And we wonder what works that you did. Then we find in John, the fifth chapter, the 19th verse, that you said, I do nothing until I see the Father doing it first. And then you promise that. We know it's true. Now for once more, Lord. And then it's complete. And may many of the Johns that shut up today in prison find men and women that know you as their Savior, and they've been wondering, oh God, may they see that you're right on schedule, you're right on time. Grant it, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, just before we have our altar call, I'm just a little late tonight. And I thought last night I preached. I'm going to tell Billy I sure made it tonight, and he told me I couldn't preach less than an hour and a half, but I sure got it out that time by the help of the Lord. Now... I believe we give out prayer cards yesterday, or did he give out any today, or what was that one, one to a hundred I believe he gave out yesterday, wasn't it? What was that, A's? A's, all right. Where did we start? We, went, we started from one yesterday, didn't we? One? Well, let's start from the back of them. Let's take, let's start and get about just a few up here, because our times, let's start from 80. How many has never been in one of the meetings before? Raise your hand. Let's look at there. Half the meeting. If Jesus Christ, how many knows that Jesus Christ has already healed the sick, already saved the lost? Praise. Now, he couldn't save you or heal you. He'd just tell you he's already done it. You'd have to believe it. Yeah. But he promised that the works that he did would we do also, and especially in this evening time. How many knows that? Please, that's the truth. Does it say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah. He certainly is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right. If he is, then may he act that way. Now, all you in the prayer lines thing there, that's a strange to me that you know that I don't know nothing about you. Raise up your hands. All that know. Every one of them. All, right, all out there, you people that hasn't got a prayer card, and you want to be healed, and you know I know nothing about you. Raise up your hands. All the people. Every person in the building that knows that I know nothing about you, raise up your hands. Every one. I don't think there's a person that I can see that I know... If I'm not mistaken, this is a preacher from Arkansas sitting right here. I believe these lights, you see, I, I can't see him too well, but I think that's a preacher from Arkansas. How many knows that one time there was a woman come in the prayer line? There was a lady come into, she said in her heart, if I can only touch the border of that man's garment, I'll be made well. She had a blood issue. You remember that? And she slipped through the crowd and she touched about like that. Now, you never felt that. And you know, Brother Tommy, the underneath garment of the Palestine and the big long robe. 
uh, the robe wore underneath garment on account of the dust. The robe picked it up. Now, if she touched the border of that garment, went back out in the audience, and Jesus said, Who touched me? Now, that was the Son of God. Who touched me? And Peter rebuked him and said, Well, oh, what we, well the people think there's something wrong with you there. Well, everybody's touching you. You know, fellow uh, highly irreverent and so forth, you know, a rabbi. He said, But I perceive that I got weak. How many know that virtue is strength? Sir? A strength went out of me. Somebody touched me. And he turned around and kept looking over the audience until he found where it was at. And he said, told her about her blood issue had stopped because of her faith had saved her. Yes. Is that the truth? Amen. Well, now, is he tonight, you minister, brethren, that we eat with this morning? This uh, brother here, I believe, is a brother that talked about all the degrees he got in, in, in a Baptist uh, school. Doctor, and Ph.D., and I don't know what all he's telling us about it. But he had to forget it all like Paul to know Christ. So then, um, But uh, the Scripture teaches us over in Hebrews that he's a high priest now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. That's right. How many knows that to be so? Yes. Well, then, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, how would he act if you touched him? See? He'd act the same, wouldn't he? A little while, and the world sees me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also. Is that right? And he promised this would come to the Gentile people, not down through the Lutheran age, Wesleyan age, but at the end time yes. it would happen. Now, don't you see? He's right on time. Yes, he is. Right on. And remember, this is done went around the world. So we're at the end, there's no doubt. No doubt. But you touch his garment. Now, what is it, Brother Branham? It's not me. And it wouldn't do a thing to me if you didn't do it. It's, it you're just as much into it as I am. It's got to be your faith that does his, touches him so that he'll speak through me. It's just a gift to yield myself to him. Just give him my eyes, my mind, my tongue, my being. I, I don't know none of you, but it's, it's him speaking through there. See? It's him doing that. So it, it isn't me. So what caused it to do it? I don't know you. You say, about me, Brother Bram, I don't know. About me, I don't know. But he does know. So you touch him, then he just uses me back. So see, it's you and I together as his servants. And he makes himself known to his people that he's right on time. He's right with the schedule, just exactly, just before the end time when the evening lights would shine. Now, if he will do that, how many will love him and believe him and accept him? God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, the rest is in your hands. I commit myself in this audience to you. Just one case will prove it, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, let it happen. Amen. I'll be real reverent. Don't get up no more. Sit still. Be real reverent. Just a few moments. Now, one word from him will mean more than I could say in... 50, 100 lifetimes, just one word from him. Now, you out there now that don't have no prayer card or whatever you are, whatever your condition is, you just say, oh, great high priest, let me touch you. And Brother Bram don't know me. And then you turn him around to me and let him tell me uh, what I'm praying about. Let him tell me what's wrong with me. He don't know me or well, something that I'm thinking or doing or whatever it is. Let him tell me. I believe you. Because the Bible said that's just the way he would do. That's the way he did do. That's the way he will do. And you see, friends, if one time made Jesus feel weak, what would it do to me, a sinner? You'll never know until we beat the gate up there what, I, what, what the price is. But... That's, I'm not complaining, I'm thanking God, you see, just so that you'll understand. Well, days we come down and they give out prayer cards, and then along, I pick up those prayer cards along down through the week of, of picking up some here and some over here and down here so it won't, everybody won't rally for prayer card number one, see, 
So they, and then the boy, before he gives them out, he comes down and stands before the audience and mixes these cards up. Mixes them all up. I guess you see him do that. All right. Then he goes down, if you want one, to give you one. Then the boy can't say, well, now, uh, I gave her number one. He don't know himself. He just passes it up. So he mixes it up. Gives you, he might give you ten, and the next one by side would be ninety-five. So then somewhere along through the week, I keep, I call from twenty to thirty, or from fifty to ninety, or ninety back to twenty, or somewhere along like that, wherever the Lord lays up on my heart, because that way, well, then, uh, just wherever the Holy Spirit leads to call. It happens to be tonight, by that lead, this woman, a colored woman, me a white man, I'm a stranger to you. We do not know one another. This is our first time meeting. See now? Now, if the Holy Spirit still remains the Holy Spirit that was in Christ, is in us tonight. If that's the same Spirit, then it will do the same work. If this is truly the Holy Spirit, then it will do the work of the Holy Spirit. If it will do the work of Jesus. And that way you can be sure then what he was back there, you know what he is now. So let's take St. John, the fourth chapter. There was, uh, when he, being a Jew, met a Samaritan woman. And he talked to her a few minutes to catch her spirit. And then he told her uh, where her trouble was. And she said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. And she said uh, uh, to him that, and he said, um, uh, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? And all the people believe, and every one, Jesus never done it to one more person. But the whole city believed on him. He never healed anybody, just went in there, declared himself the woman. And the Bible said that the whole city believed on him because of the testimony of the woman. Now, if that was Jesus yesterday, and he can come to the same thing as a, an African girl and an Anglo-Saxon man standing here, and if he can reveal to me something that you're here for, something that you have done, or something like that, you know, you know whether it's the truth or not. You certainly would. And then if he can tell you what has been, certainly he can tell you what will be. Do you believe that? To all the colored people here, white too, and whatever and more, you believe that with all your heart? Uh, now, if any of you people don't believe this is the truth, and you believe it's psychology, I haven't got no Ph.D. You come here and do it yourself. I'm waiting for you. Then if you're afraid to come, accept it or keep still about it. <laughs> I said that because I was led to do it. There's something going on that I, I know about. <laughs> you're aware that something's going on here, too. One of your troubles is nervousness. Really extremely nervous. There it comes. He guessed it. I ever you get that? Right? I can say somebody out there is nervous. Somebody, the Lord says something. But who is that somebody? This is that somebody. Stan, this, she's a, got a nice spirit. Pacific. Nervous? You got trouble with your shoulder too. That's right. You got heart trouble also. Is that right? You got a burden on your heart. Is that true? Yeah. It's about a boy. Uh huh. Is it an institution? Yeah. Hospital. Yeah. So, You're praying about him. Yeah. You may tell you who you are? Yeah. Miss Richardson. Yeah. Go believe. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You'll never know what that does. It just kills the very life. A real reverend, everyone. How do you do, sir? We are strangers to each other. We are. <clears throat> but Jesus knows us both and says us both. If God will just let me know what you're standing here for. 
so I wouldn't have to go in too much detail. See, a whole got a whole line standing there, and others out there praying. See what it does to me. But if he just tell me something about you, you'd believe. Of course, one of the things that you're wanting to pray for is your eyes. Of course, you're wearing glasses. Anybody can see that. That's not always the matter with the man. It's something else because he's got a shadow over him to death. And his eyes wouldn't do that. He beat him. Tuberculosis. You had an operation for it. Wasn't successful. Hasn't done like it should have done. Is that right? Do you believe now it's going to be all right? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Just believe it all Thank you, Jesus. Would you believe that he is the Son of God and heals you? Will you would? Then just walk on by and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That ulcer will get all right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know you. We are strangers to one another. <clears throat> Do you believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God? Do you believe he sent me as a messenger to the church in this last days to produce this scripture and give a gift, not because it was me, not because he had to get, he, had, he probably usually does get somebody who don't know nothing so he can show himself. Do you believe that these things that I speak of is truth for the scripture? She seems to be so full of sorrow is the reason I, I was talking to her a minute. Yes. It is. The first thing is for yourself. You had a, an operation, and that was a female lady's trouble. Uh, clean out of all the inside uh, uh, of the female organs was removed. But it, it backfired. It done something at uh, just a moment. It's, uh, the doc it's ruptured. It ruptured and you had to return. You had to go back. But you're, you're, that ain't really your sorrow. Your sorrow is about a child. It's your child. And it's, uh, it's had some disease or something wrong. TB. And now it has some kind of a weak spell. Like. That's right. You've got another one that you're bothered about. And it's got an ear trouble. That's right. Your name is Mrs. Smith. You don't believe the Lord is in you. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. You believe? Amen. Oh, have faith. Hallelujah. Just, just have faith. Believe. Hallelujah. Um, how do you do, lady? We are strangers to each other. I, I don't know you. As far as I know, I've never seen you in my life. And we just meet here for the first time. If I, if I could do something for you and wouldn't do it, then I'd be a, I'd be a bad person. I'm not, not ought to be standing behind the pulpit here as a minister. And uh, I could not help you. And uh, if he was standing here himself and wearing these clothes that he'd give me, he could only prove that he was Messiah, that it did for you, but you'd have to have faith that he did it for you or you wouldn't work anyhow. Isn't that right? But if he would stand here and tell you something, what your trouble is, or what you've done, what you ought not have done, or something about it, then you'd have faith to believe it, wouldn't you? Would that raise the faith of the audience now? You're dimming out to me. Well, you had an accident. Mm -hmm. The bother in the head. And then you're having trouble in your left side. That's right. Complications. So many things wrong. That is true. That's true. Yes. If God would tell me who you are, would it help you, Miss Terry? My Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. Do you believe with all your heart now? He heals heart trouble, doesn't he? You believe he does? 
Just go right here. Thank, thank you, dear God. Thank you. Pray in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You believe he heals arthritis and makes yes. people well? All right. A lady's trouble and heart trouble. You believe he'll make you well? But go right on the road rejoicing. <laughs> Praise Praise the Lord. You're young to have anemic condition, but you believe he transfuses blood? Oh, oh, go. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Believe you. Praise Science and all. You believe he heals it? Just go say Hallelujah. thank you, Lord Praise Jesus. God. Hallelujah. You'll have to have an operation for that tumor, but you believe God will heal you with it? All right, let's go around here. Oh, Saying thank you, Lord. Come. Thank you. Come, lady. Hallelujah. You believe he heals nervousness? All right, go on your road Praise rejoicing. Uh, Saying thank you, Lord. And thank you, Jesus. What if it didn't say nothing to you? Would you believe me anyhow? Come here. In the name of Jesus, may she be healed. Thank go you, believe Lord. me. Hallelujah. Come. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. Just a moment, just a moment, something happened somewhere. Could those people going by there was in the prayer line going back there? No, that might have been. What? Mr. sitting right back here in the row, sitting right here looking at me. You're suffering with a prostrate trouble. Yes, sir. Sitting there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Have you a prayer card? You don't have a prayer card, do you? You don't need it. Your faith heals you. This second woman from there is your wife. That's right. I see you in the home together. And she suffers with trouble with her liver. That's right. If it's right, raise up your hand. Go home. Jesus Christ makes you well. That lady sitting out next to you has something wrong with her tongue. You believe, lady? If that's true, raise up your hand. All right? Go home. You sitting on the end out there. What about you? There it is over you now. Got bladder trouble. That's right. All right? You believe? All right. Go home and be well. Hallelujah. Be accepted. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. What did they touch? Hallelujah. Where? Where sort of man started crying, sitting right back here, this man, that young fella. Now that man, I've never seen him in my life. But listen, son, you got stomach trouble. That's right. But you was praying, the Spirit come up on you, a real wonderful feeling. If I'm a stranger and you wave your hand like this, I don't know you. Is that what's trouble with you? Wave your hand. All right, you're healed. Jesus Praise Christ. You. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This lady sitting right back there suffering with epilepsy. Do you believe that God will make you well? To heal you? Praise God. Do you believe it? Thank you. If you'll accept your healing, then spells will leave you. Praise and you won't have it anymore. Thank you, Lord. Believe it. Oh, how The little lady sitting there looking at me on the side with her hand up like this, something wrong with her ankle. You believe that God will make you well? All right, you can have your healing. Praise This lady standing there with your hand up. You're ready for an operation, that little tumor, but God will take it out and make you well. You believe it? Praise God. Don't believe it. Praise this kind of woman with a white band around her head here, colored lady, God got her trouble. <laughs> you believe God will heal you? What about you in a wheelchair? You believe me to be his prophet? You'll die sitting there. You have one chance to live, like the lepers was, instead of the gate of Samaria. I cannot heal you, sister. I'm no healer. But those Samaritans, they said, if we sit here, we'll die. If we go in the city, we'll die. So the only chance we got is to go to the camp of the enemy. If they kill us, we're going to die anyhow. But if they save us, we'll be alive. They have one chance out of millions. You ain't got that kind of a chance. You're invited tonight to the home of a real loving God. Stand up on your feet now. Let's rise and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise up. If you believe him, stand up on your feet in the name of Jesus Christ and accept your healing. Hallelujah. 